If you are listening to this podcast, well, you're probably a dude. And you're probably at a crossroads in your life, specifically in regards to relationships with women. Maybe you're still married and you want to kick things up a notch or two. Perhaps you're considering divorce, or perhaps you're already divorced and a little lost and wondering where life is going to take you next. Well, guys, the good news is that you do not have to do this all alone. I have assembled a group of 800 plus men from around the world, and we call ourselves the DSO Fraternity. We have live and recorded member meetings, private online discussion groups, members-only podcasts, members-only articles, as well as access to all of my DSO books in PDF and audiobook format. The whole purpose of the DSO fraternity is to get men that sense of connection that is so sorely lacking today. So, check out the DSO fraternity at dsofraternity.com and just try it out for a month. I think you'll be glad that you did. And now, on to our show. So welcome, Scott and Gail, to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me, man. No problem. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So for those of you that don't know, we have, uh, this is Scott and Gail, and we chatted with Scott before. If you do a search in your podcast app for Dr. Scott, you can find our conversation. Scott read my book, The Dead Bedroom Fix, which you can find on my website at dadstartingover.com, amazon.com, all the regular retailers and um, it became pretty popular and since writing that book the dad starting over business has kind of blossomed and we created a DSO fraternity a members only group of which Scott is a member and uh, we had another gentleman on here before named Austin who's a member of the group became a coach and then he brought his wife on the show and they talked about uh, Austin's transformation well this is much the same Scott has brought his wife, Gail, on the show, and we're going to talk about his transformation and what that means for their relationship, and more specifically, what that meant for Gail going through all of this. So, Scott, we talked about before, we don't want to go down that road too awful much in the details, but you had a pretty bad uh, run there for a little bit, for a period of how long, would you say? Uh, where I was really a mess mentally, it was the better part of a year, um, yeah. but... I would say right around five to six years, I forgot about the lover side of the relationship. And I was uh, very comfortable at that mm -hmm. at that point. And um, I was not a very good romantic uh, for about five to six years. And so, Gail, we want to focus, though, on what I would assume was a pretty stressful time for you as the wife of a man who was going through some pretty acutely stressful period in his life where he was really at the end of his rope. And uh, is this something that was very obvious to you being his wife? You know, walk us through what you were feeling during all this. Well, he's really good at hiding um, all that. We, at the time we had a practice, we owned a practice or we do, we own a practice together, an optometry practice. We have had two small children we still have them they're just bigger now um, but we have two children so we had the practice we have two children we had gone through some issues at work with a previous owner and a situation with some rental issues mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it was it was bad um so but there were so many things i felt like that were stacked on top of each other that some of that i just felt like was normal life yeah um so it was we go to work, we turn out, you know, between the two of us, 60 patients, we come home, we turn into mom and dad, we are running the kids where they need to go, we're taking them to their activities, then we put the kids to bed. And then th there, there were all these things that were compounded on top of each other. So I think that I, I knew he was stressed. I was stressed. I didn't know, I didn't understand the depths of it at that point. I I knew I was depressed or not depressed. I knew my anxiety was high. I've mm -hmm. always had high anxiety. I knew it was higher than it had been. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I called my doctor, said I'm having all this anxiety. I was put on medication. Um, I'm trying to fix you know, my side of it. He was really good at hiding how bad he felt. Yeah. Um, yeah. I knew it was bad, but I thought it was bad for both of us. And I didn't know at the time what was normal life stress what was normal marriage stress mm -hmm. and what was really the depths of it i really didn't know until 
the, the really the rock bottom that the yeah. night that was the worst of it. I didn't really know until that night. So he just had a breakdown basically. Yes. We had a big argument and he left uh, and was gone for two hours. And this sounds really bad, but I was so mad sure. when he left because my thought was, okay, we just had this argument and he gets to leave and go figure it out and get some air and get away from the situation. But we yeah. had two sleeping children upstairs. Yeah. Somebody had to yeah. stay home and be the grown up. And so I was so mad and I feel so bad saying this. And he came home and I was still so angry that I was the one that had to stay home that I couldn't go and blow off steam. He, and, and he came back in and he's just irate and he's packing his stuff and he's saying he's moving back to Iowa. He's going home. This is North Carolina was never for him. And I, I think I might have laughed at him, <laughs> which didn't go over all that well. No, um, because I was I, I was like, are, are you kidding me? You're, you're not going to leave. You're not going to leave me and your practice and your children. You wouldn't do that. And then he said, well, I've driven around looking for overpasses. Mm, and to, to run my car into and I'm, I'm 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 like what excuse me <laughs> yeah that's totally different isn't it that's yeah, not, that, that, yeah that took it to a whole nother level i mean yeah. there's there's being there's there's mental health issues and there's anxiety and there's depression and then yeah. there's flat out i'm gonna ram my car into yeah. it yeah as, as, as we call it suicidal ideation that's, yes that's every mental health professional will say uh-oh that's when it's get help time yes yeah and so, so what were the next steps then? I'm try, I was trying to remember, really. We talked about getting him help. We talked about him seeing a therapist. We talked about getting medications. And then it, he really didn't want to talk about any of those things because that wasn't who he was. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, and, and in my mind, it was a little bit of denial because you can't be suicidal and then decide nope i'm not going to do any of those things yeah uh, but we I'll, changed sorry i was like we changed some things at work well actually I'll, I'll i'll intervene here a little bit um what really diffused that situation was i i had my bags like i had a suitcase half packed and i actually kind of woke up from the fog uh, that i was in for the, the last couple hours and I saw my wife com a complete wreck and, and I, I realized kind of what I was really doing in the moment. And cause it was all emotions before that. And then I just kind of, kind of snapped out of it yeah. and looked at her and I was just like, okay, <laughs> whoa, what, what, okay, what am I doing right now? And then, and that's, that's what diffused that situation where we started talking um, instead of just yelling and, and, and just being emotional. And that that was I, I I can still see the image in my head of the of my, the bag packed halfway and I don't think I'll ever forget that image honestly um, yeah. and that that's that's when things changed that that was the moment that changed me to go more positive in the future and so Gail's talking about seeing you up to this point and as far as she's concerned you hid it pretty well is that something that you were um, purposely doing you know I, I i recognize what's going on in my head but i'm kind of shielding my wife from it she doesn't need to know she can't handle this uh it was more of the it was more of the my dad in me um you know with the, the previous talk that we had mm -hmm. um i'm the man i'm supposed to deal with shit and you know you know I'm, I'm not supposed to just you know puke all of my emotions out and and i just have to well it in and deal with it mm -hmm. and it got to be too much, you know, yeah. and it just, it, I, I hit a critical mass and, you know, those CD, the suicidal ideations probably lasted the, the really bad stuff lasted for about a month. Um, oh, wow. but That's that was the good. night where yeah. really, that was the night where I was like, I'm, I, I may do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and, Gail, had you seen up to this point during your marriage or courtship or whatever, had you ever seen him? It, it, did this kind of response, I guess, is a better way of saying it, did this, this come as a surprise to you? Was this the Scott that you knew? No, it was not the Scott that I knew. Yeah. 
Um, and in your mind, did the level of stress that you were under with the business and so forth, did the, did it warrant quote unquote, this level of a reaction from your husband or you kind of taken aback by wow, or do you, or was there kind of an understanding and empathy on your part of, yeah, I can see it, where a person's pushed to the edge like this. Yeah, it was pretty bad at that point. Yeah. Um, there were a lot of things that led up to that, that I think that we didn't have the right support system. We thought we did, but we didn't have the right support system for each other hmm. prior to that from mm -hmm. several years of just several years of going through the motions, going through the motions. Yes. Yep. Going through the motions. Um, and our, that's where I feel like we've had a strong marriage and I don't feel like we ever had the moment of their marriage was in trouble, but yep. we were definitely going through the motions and going through those we, almost mundane, just getting through the day. Sure. And so, the support system, the, I mean, y'all talk about intimacy all the time, all of that, um, that wasn't there. And so mm -hmm. I knew we were both stressed about the work situation. I knew we were both stressed about two small kids. You know, there's the, so there was, there were all these levels. Um, and so, yes, I can see where he got pushed to that point. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I do think the situation, the work situation in particular, He'll tell you, and I think Tos has said this before, he felt very threatened in his manhood. Mm. Uh, and he's never felt that way before. And so this man just really got under his skin. And it was scary, but more just anger when you yeah. feel like someone's taking complete advantage of you. And, mm -hmm. and so we handled it very differently, but I think that's just a female-male version. Yeah. Here's a sensitive question that kind of takes the discussion on a – left turn a little bit, but I think it, it, it pertains to it somewhat is, you know, you're well aware of, uh, Scott's par parental situation, his parents, where his mother had a long-term affair. Mm -hmm. Um, do you see that that has had by your estimation, any impact on him and how he processes things and how he works within your, the parameters of your relationship? Well, we have discussions or had discussions over the past, over the years, over the past 16 years of how we want our marriage to look and how we don't want our marriage to look. And I don't know, I wouldn't say that it's the way that his parents interact with each other influenced him, but I can, we definitely, when things, when we would have bad moments, that would be kind of our go-to. If I was angry or we weren't connecting, it was my go-to. It was my, I don't want to be your parents. Mm -hmm. I don't hey, want. She would, she would call me by my father's name. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it would really piss me <laughs> off. Yeah. But when we would do the, he in the bedroom playing video games and me at the counter working in, you know, on the other side of the house for two hours at night, instead of hanging out together, I would have the, okay, this is what your parents do. I love them to death, but I don't want their marriage. Mm -hmm. That's not what I see for myself and yeah. our future. So that would be our go-to is that we don't want to be like them. Mm -hmm. And you, um, have, you have a good relationship with your in-laws now, Gail? I do. I mean, it's hard. We're, we're in North Carolina. They're in Iowa. So oh, we don't true. see them a lot. So that's hard when we do see them. It's great. Mm -hmm. um, well, what about, you know, given my background and all the men I talk to, when I hear the story of the, the mother's long-term affair, that makes my ears perk up. Um, that, that has some pretty big ramifications for the whole family, you know, extended family, in-laws and so forth. Is there a little bit of a odd tension there, you know, that everyone knows that you know? And we just kind of pretend that nothing really happened. Everything's hunky dory. We're starting over type of thing. It really doesn't come up a lot, but there are certain times I forget now, but there are certain times where certain things will be said yeah, or yeah. about somebody else, you know, Oh, we mm -hmm. have this friend whose mother or not mother would have this friend whose wife cheated on him. And then it's like, Oh, whoops. You know, we went yeah, there and it's yeah. not even meaning to, or, watching a TV show where the people are divorced or I mean, it's just, so there's mm -hmm. a little bit of like not in your throat, but that was when all that happened and Scott and his family found out that was before 
it was Scott and I were married. It's about the time we got engaged. Oh well, right. yeah. We found out. Yeah. So it was really before. I mean, I remember myself and my future brother-in-law sitting in the basement while he and his family, sister and two parents were having the discussion upstairs. Wow. And so it was very awkward. Like they were upstairs having this discussion and we were downstairs hanging out, wondering what the heck was going on upstairs. And then yeah. later they tell us, oh, this is what we found out. Oh, okay, wow. well, I'm going to go back to Memphis now because I was in Memphis at the time and Scott was at, in Iowa. And I was like, okay, I'll see you next weekend. <laughs> I would say one thing that's uh, about that situation is that my my parents have buried that particular topic Mm -hmm. deep, Mm -hmm. and the only time it ever comes up is if I'm actually the only one with them. So I don't know about my sister. I don't know if she she does that or not. I doubt it because she's definitely not as she's not she's not me. But that's it has come up here and there but it's more the fact that like they know that my mom is my mom my dad is my dad like i don't it doesn't make what she did didn't does not affect the way i think about my parents Mm -hmm. and they know that so um we absolutely do not openly talk about it it's never been mentioned around me i'll just Mm -hmm. put it that way like it's never been mentioned i think the fact that this happened um so late in your life, Scott, you know, this didn't happen when you were like, you know, a crucial age when you were a little kid or something. I I think that helps that you're able to process it in a more mature way. And it it can be argued that it doesn't have that much of a, as much of a a negative impact on you going forward in your relationships. You know, a kid who's like pre pubertal and he's watching, you know, mom cheat on dad and everything that, that can, that can cross some wires in the old brain and they, they see it later on in life. So I could see where it doesn't have that much of a, uh, as much of an impact on you going forward. One thing I hear, though, from a lot of guys, and I don't know, Gail, if you saw this as well, was um, it, it breeds some distrust in men, of women in general. Mm. And it's where, you know, who were you talking to? What do you, what was that text message just now? Who, who were you out with? So you never saw any of that with Scott? I didn't. That's good. I didn't. No, I mean, that. no, we have a pretty, in that respect, we have a pretty solid relationship. Mm-hmm. Very good. So I don't think he ever thought, I mean, I don't know if we'll get into this later, but I'm kind of a goody two shoes. <laughs> 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 so I don't think conservative. that I'm conservative. So don't think that well, he, but I'll tell you what, I, and Scott will tell you, he's been on these discussion groups. We've, we've heard it all. And, no, um, there is a, um, uh, you know, uh, this is going to sound insulting or whatever, but it's not a, it's not uncommon for me to hear. Um, we came from a very Christian conservative household, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And next thing I know, I caught my wife with man number four the other day. Mm-hmm. Um, it happens. And you know what I've heard several times while we're really going off on a different tangent here? Um, ministers, uh, preachers, mm-hmm. they, um, I don't know if it's because they're in a, in a position of power um, if there's a lot of trust in them or if they're left alone, I don't know what it is, but I've heard that, I don't know, half a dozen times that I caught my wife with the preacher or the minister, whatever huh. we call them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so anywho. goes back to the safety and security that you talk about, right? Yeah. I mean, you've- <laughs> yeah. So, exactly. Who would you feel safer with than the guy who's at the head of the church? And yeah. Right. <laughs> but, um, anywho, moving on. So, that we had that big incident, but there is Scott, you hinted at well, the, the incident's one thing, you know, with your, your uh, mental trauma, if we want to call it that. And, and you've dealt with it and you've processed it and you've worked together as a couple through it. Hallelujah. That's awesome. But it was kind of um, precipitated by years of kind of blahness between the two of you. And Scott will be the first to raise his hand and say, I had a big part in that blahness. I had the video game thing. I had the porn thing, both of which can be kind of uh, categorized as escapism. I'm just kind of running over here and doing my little thing. The rest of the world, you go off and do whatever. Just leave me alone. Um, how long did that go for, you think? Go on for, I should say. Oh, probably the better part. Well, so there were uh, there were several stages of that. Yeah. Uh, the first one was around 2015 and lasted about a year. Uh, then we had a, that was a, a mobile gaming issue, which was 
Hmm. That was awful. Worse than a video game issue because it went everywhere with us. In his pocket, yeah. So there were there was Thanksgiving and where Scott always oh, in the bathroom. Okay, what well, what was he doing in the bathroom playing video games and you know, um, so that was uh, that was a bad year. Oh yeah. Uh, mostly because it traveled with us and we couldn't get away from it. Um, then we when we kind of blew up over that one and I felt like we got past that one. Then it came back around several years later with uh, when he started playing video games with our son, which started out really cute and innocent because our son was eight at the time and would play video games, different what Fortnite and mm-hmm. such. And it started out as, oh, daddy and, and, and his son can play together and started out, like I said, cute and fun. And then our son would go to bed and Scott would play with his own friends <laughs> and to the point where, so we would, the console was out in our den and he would be loud. And I would, I was afraid that he would wake up our children. So he moved it into our bedroom. So, uh, so the video game setup was now in our bedroom. Nice. Um, yeah. Right. Sexy buddy. <laughs> Sexy. Uh, so he would play he would play with our son during the day and then we'd put our kids to bed and he would come back in the bedroom and turn it back on and play with these people that he met from around the world, which was completely creepy to me because I don't know. I mean, the video game world, I kept asking him like, like, how do you know these people are 40 years old? They could be 12 year olds. Or I had this mental picture of all these men sitting in their basement in their whitey tighties playing (laughs) video games. And, and, and that's what my husband wanted to do. And he felt like he was making all these amazing friendships. Mm -hmm. And I, and I kept asking him, well, what, what about our friends here? Because we don't go out to dinner with our friends here because you're playing video games. Yeah, (laughs) I felt like it was then, you know, then it started intruding on And then it became not just a, let me go in at 8 p.m. and play. Then it became, I'm going to go in at 8 when the kids go to bed, and I'm going to play till 2 a.m. or or 3 a.m. And then I'm going to have a pounding headache the next morning and can't go to work Mm -hmm. because I have a migraine. Well, so then he's calling into work sick, but he's telling, so he's not getting out of bed in the morning and I'm, I'm asking him, um, are you coming to work? And he's mm-hmm. like, Oh, I have this migraine. So then I'm either having to deal with rescheduling the patients or I'm having to see the patients for him. And I know good and well, it's well, I, there were some times that I didn't know one side of me was mad because I'm like, you were, I don't have a migraine. You stayed up until 3 a.m. playing video games. But then on the flip side is that he did have migraines. And so then I'm like, well, why are you getting migraines all the time? Now, is there a health concern? Do I need to take you to a neurologist? Do we need to get your brain scanned? Because he was a race car driver in his previous life. And so he had these concussions. So is there something wrong or is he just staying up all night? And then there was, oh, then it was where we get home from church and the kids and I sit down to eat lunch and oh dad's just got to do this one thing on the video game before he comes in Mm. and so all of a sudden then the kids are like well was daddy gonna eat lunch with us today and is daddy gonna eat dinner with us today and it just it became I was I became obsessed and yeah you haven't already figured this out about me since I've been in the group I I I'm not OCD but when I do things I don't do things half-assed ever I go in full yeah. bore and 100% and, or nothing. And now there, there's a positive aspect to that, which is when that, when the energy is directed in the proper way and contained in the proper way and focused, what you describe tends to be highly successful people. Absolutely. When uh, he does it at work, it's very successful. Yeah. yeah. When he's playing video games, it's not yeah. so it, yeah. Exactly. And then when it's focused on the wrong thing, boy, that snowballs big time in a hurry. Um, well, and there could be worse things. I mean, there could, there could be alcohol. There could be drugs. Which I was yeah. going to, yeah, my next point was that, you know, what you're describing is somebody who has a um, an addictive side. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I do have an addictive side, obviously, with the porn issue, too. Yeah, so that all kind of ties in together. So you're mm -hmm. once you get kind of that, uh, I, I'm no scientist, dopamine hit, is, I don't know if that's the proper term. Yeah. All about dopamine. Yeah, so when you get that hit, yay, I want more, I want more, I want more. Um, yeah, and I will, I'll add one thing with, yeah. uh, she mentioned the mobile app. Um, it was uh, these mobile apps that are um, game-based, What they're they are designed to drain your wallet. Oh, yeah. Those, those games specifically on on cell phones are they're all designed to, to drain your wallet. And so not only a source of tension, but also our finances. Yeah, oh, really? Wow! So you started yeah. seeing six I bucks mean, here, twenty bucks there. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Plus more. Oh, yeah. Add it up. I mean, yeah. it's it's a gambling issue. It I mean, was gambling. Point. Absolutely, that's what it was. It, because the game had a little, almost like a roulette. Mm. Uh, part of it, you know, and I honestly started playing that game because it was a Marvel game where my son was super into Captain America at the time. He was only about five years old, and I wanted to get him Captain America, and it got me hooked. <laughs> that game got me hooked, and that's what happened with that particular one. And I will yeah. never, ever have a, a mobile game on my phone ever again because that mobile app was probably the i would say that would be the the closest we ever came to being being done wow well so this that. this is a perfect segue into okay we all recognize scott has a problem <laughs> more, than one. more than one i love him i do it's, it's, i don't want this to be totally negative no I no no <laughs> but here's the point you know and you may not know gail that i wrote a little short quick read of a book called red flags and it's it's aimed toward I've heard about it. It's aimed towards <laughs> men to say, if you're looking for Mrs. Right, here's some things to look out for. Well, if I were to write a book for well, this goes for anybody. Um, for women, it may be here are some red flags, and some of those red flags may be does he exhibit some addictive personality traits, such as you know pornography, gambling, drinking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but one thing I say pretty bluntly in the book Red Flags is, hey, just because you see some things doesn't mean all right. I'm out of here. It means, all right, let me pay attention because this could get into something not so good. Well, what's the difference between, hey, by the way, we all have red flags, right? Everybody has something that's not so great. We're not perfect. Um, where does it go from, hey, none of us are perfect to, uh-oh, this is a problem. It's when people say, you know what? I got an issue here. I need to take this mobile app off my phone. And honey, if you ever see me with a mobile app again, you, you're free to take my phone away from me. Th that's a healthy person. Um, right. Hey, uh, this porn issue, I need to research. Why is it I'm always on this porn? What can I do to get away from this porn? You know, the more I learn about it, the more I realize it's engineered to keep me coming back for more. I just need to put some kind of block or something on my computer and just stay the hell away from it. That's healthy. Um, do you feel that he has put an, enough of those uh, what's the word obstacles in the way the good obstacles in the way between him and going down this road again i'm about 90 percent confident mm -hmm. <laughs> only because uh because we i feel like we've kind of done gone through some of this before i mean way early in our marriage and i hate to talk about the video games again but way early in our marriage right after we got married there were there were video games um and there were video games we into the hours of the night and he when he got when he put that one away he gave all that equipment away i'm never doing that again he gave all of it away then 10 years later here comes the mobile app i'm mm -hmm. never playing a mobile app again okay but then came it was, then it came uh, the son. The son happens. that wanted daddy to play with him. Yeah, so then it, happened. so I, I do, because I think that honestly, you know, and I justified it. I will take, I mean, I will take a little bit of the blame because Scott's the type of person who doesn't just sit around and watch TV or sit around. Like he has to be doing something. So mm -hmm. Years ago, it was racing, and he would, at night, that's what he would do. After we put the kids to bed, he would go out to the shop, and he would work in the shop for two hours, three hours, and then come back in. So he was doing something, and when he retired from racing, you know, at, at that point, him being out in the shop at night didn't piss me off as much as the video games because I felt like it was productive. Like He mm -hmm. was out there working on the car. He produced a car out of it. He drove the car. Uh, so there was something productive with, even though I'm 
that's a whole nother well, uh, a whole nother and, topic. And at a very basic level, it's a very manly, masculine thing yeah. to do to be race yes. car. I mean, you can't get more masculine than that. I mean, Paul, <laughs> Paul Newman, you know, race car driver right. kind of thing um, versus, you know, sitting hunched over at night yes. playing video games in the dark with 12 year olds that are, you know, <laughs> from California or something. It's just <laughs> not but the I most masculine just, endeavor. Right. Yeah. But I kind of justified it. Cause I was like, he needs an out. We kept saying, you know, Scott needs an out. He needs a stress reliever. Um, he needs a hobby. And so video games became this hobby. And then there were, there were a couple of our friends whose husbands played. And so then he was playing some with, some really good friends of ours and so we justified mm -hmm. it because oh well you're playing with our friend it's fine very successful people yes by the way, very too. successful people oh sure um and so for, I think for I the for the record but, for the record i like video games i was a big video game nerd back in the day um and scott you may like this i have a stand-up arcade machine at home that has uh there's it's a system called mame m-a-m-e and it allows you to emulate thousands of arcade games, like actual games that we had as a kid in the arcade. Well, me as a kid, I think I'm older than you. And I have 19,000 games on an arcade machine. Oh, wow. <laughs> nice. mm -hmm. Right outside my door, right here. And, but, yeah. uh, but, I can honest, but I can honestly say I play it once, and then I don't touch it again for a few weeks, and I don't really miss it all that much. And every now and then my 10-year-old my would be like, you want to play the fighting game, Street Fighter? And I'd say, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have that mechanism. I never really had that gets me hooked on something like that. But I can certainly relate to once I get into something, oh, yeah. I'm very hyper. I think it's a very masculine thing, a very man thing, where a lot of men get hyper-focused on work. And, you know, the, the wife's calling him at the office and it's 8 p.m. saying, are you coming home today? And he's just got blinders on. He's like, I got to finish this project. And it takes somebody at the office to go, you know, dude, go on home. We'll finish it up tomorrow. Go see your family. All right, fine. That's you know very stereotypical man thing. Getting putting up blinders and getting lost in that. But your to answer your question, though, I feel like yeah. I feel like this has reached a whole new level. And because after this last video game episode, where he's given all that equipment, well, our son has part of it, and part of it's gone away. But it's not in our bedroom anymore, and. He's gone through this year long. I mean, we're coming up on a year long journey after discovering your book and going through your fraternity and all that. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's, I mean, he's put so much effort into bettering himself that I don't feel like we would ever, I don't feel like what about we would ever go down the video game path. There is a part of me that wonders, is there another path that I don't know or, about? Or are you seeing the path right here? It's a sensitive topic, especially coming from me. Are are we seeing, is this DSO thing, in fact, the next manifestation of his hyper-focus? I believe it's looking that way. <laughs> to, to the point... Yeah, but, laughing. That's, that's kind of obvious, honestly. Yeah, but where does but it, it, but where does it cross great. over from a healthy thing? Right. Which I can, I can attest that this is a healthy, but I see him online. He's not, you know, he's not being a belligerent asshole. He's not being mean to people. He's not posting porn. He's literally like, hey, Mr. You know, people from all over the world, here's some advice and let me share my story, et cetera, et cetera. But where can that cross into uh-oh territory? Well, because it's mobile. And it can go with us. Mm, I think point. that, I mean, I think it's a great, I mean, what y'all are doing is amazing and great. And it's a mental health field. I mean, you're, which you're helping people. So it's a positive. And the people that he's meeting are different from the people that I imagine sitting in their basements playing video games. Um, but it's also mobile. And so there is a, mm -hmm. there's a side that's okay so when we go on vacation and he picks up his phone and starts texting with the 500 guys or whatever I, yep. I, there has to be some regulation in order to prevent it from becoming yeah an obsessive because he will because if when he gets like you said earlier when he gets into something he's going to do give it his hundred percent and so all of a sudden does that hundred percent be okay I finished work at five, but he didn't come home till eight because he was messaging or talking yeah. or whatever. So, I mean, there's a little bit of fear, but again, it's something productive. So kind of similar to the race car. Like I, I think it could interfere, but I don't think I'd get as emotionally distraught over mm -hmm. it. And I think the fact that we have this big in-person meeting coming up in Nashville soon, that makes it more real, more working with other men. It's not, you know, right. to him just conversing with some 12 year olds over the internet playing games right. or something. But he thought like we're that. 40, by the way. But. They are. They were 
going. We're not going. <laughs> so, but I, you know, I can see, and, and Scott, you can attest to this. Part of the fraternity, the group that we have, is it, part of it is on Facebook, using Facebook as the platform for a private discussion group. And that Facebook, they've engineered themselves to be highly addictive in terms of notifications and how you can quickly Mm -hmm. like something, dislike something, comment on something, message somebody else. You could have, you could have that phone in your hand with these groups and how active they are 24 seven and never stop. And, uh, I, I, my excuse is that this is my business and I'm growing this thing and this could potentially be big and I like to keep on top of things, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I find myself on that couch watching TV with the wife. And if there's a lull in the show, or she has to get up to go to the bathroom or something, she'd grab my phone and just start like, 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 answer, 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 uh, anytime. I don't care when it is. And uh, yeah, not necessarily a good thing. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting that uh, Shannon mentioned that specifically too. She, I was just going to say that that was something that she said about Austin was when did it clue you in that he was going through some changes? And she said when he had that dumb phone in his hand all the time. And she's like, who are you talking to? What are you doing? What little secrety things are you up to? Yep. And... Um, so I guess that's a good segue into, all right, so kind of the blahness of the marriage. It came in stages. Much of that, not to pick on poor Scott, is he had some poor behaviors. I'm not perfect. We can talk about my issues. Sure, if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to put all the blame on him. Let's put Gail on the whipping post. Good. Yeah. Well, okay, so here we are. Let's go to the point where, what is it, Scott, that made you, did you see an ad? I don't remember for the book. Uh, yeah, it was a Facebook ad. It was okay. actually the day of my awakening. It was the actual day of my awakening. And uh, it was the picture of the book that caught my attention. And uh, it was just random. Uh, you know, I just pulled up Facebook, you know, my office while I was working in between patients. And, and there it was. And I was like, uh, okay, that yeah. looks like me. So. A, a lot of men like to say, how did you know to show me? What was it in the algorithm that said, show this guy this ad? And I say, there, there's nothing nefarious going on there. Because no. I'm the I'm the guy behind the scenes of that ad, and all I said was show this to men who are married between this age and this age, and done. <laughs> That's yeah, all I did. So men from all over, are like, well, how do they know? I didn't. It's just that the majority of you are in this position. This is kind of the norm, unfortunately, for marriage. Is this picture that you see here? This guy looking over the wife as she's tapping away on her phone in bed. Mm-hmm. Um, so you saw that and said, well, that looks familiar. Um, I'm not so happy with this. So fast forward. We're not going to go through all that again. Again. For those of you listening, listen back to the episode. Dr. Steve is in the title, or excuse me, Dr. Scott is in the title if you want to find it. And so you read the book. That makes you say, well, holy crap, there's something to this. I can kind of see myself in some of this. Um, And you and your personality are such that it's, all right, time to dive into this thing 100% now. I'm going to be Mr. Self-Improvement Guy. And Mm -hmm. so... Gail, was this something that was an abrupt left turn for him? Was it a gradual process? Did he go from he was Scott to Scott num- version number two overnight? It was pretty overnight, yes. Yeah. And so um, that, that has to be, you talk about your, your issues with anxiety, um, which is, Scott, you know, you can attest to this. What percentage of the men in our group say my wife is dealing with anxiety? What, oh, ni- every ni- one of them. 90%, yeah, <laughs> at least. It's just... Um, so there's nothing to be ashamed of in that regard whatsoever. So you're feeling some anxiety. I would think my husband who has some issues in the past that makes you kind of raise your eyebrows and go, I better keep an eye on this, some addictive issues and so forth. The past, especially with an acute suicidal incident. Um, and now all of a sudden this about, you know, left face, left turn, sudden change in his demeanor, his behavior that had to induce quite a bit of anxiety in you, I would think. It was pretty confusing at first. Um, he, I'm trying to think the series of events. I believe it started with the gym and he's like, I'm going to the gym. I'm going to go to the gym. But it was, I believe that was, I'm going to go to the gym at 5 a.m. And I'm like, wait a minute. Um, you don't do the gym at 5 a.m. You don't get up at 5 a.m. This has been a sore part of our marriage for the past 16 years is that you have to have sleep. I get up and do the morning shift with our children and Scott needs his sleep. So snooze, 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 snooze. snooze. So all of a sudden he's like, I'm getting up and going to the gym before work. And I'm like, what, what that, that, that's not, this is weird. And then he's going to the, I mean, which he's always gone to the gym. 
this was just a this was much more regular, much mm. more intense. I, I went from thirty minutes to an hour and a half. Mm. So the length, yeah, the length of time. Um, he's walking at work during lunch when normally he would nap. He's like, I'm going for a walk. And I don't remember at that point. I don't think he was inviting me to go on the walks with him. I he wasn't he at was all. take he was listening to your book. He was oh, listening okay. to the I see. And he was walking at lunch, which I was not invited, which I was having some foot issues. So I couldn't go anyway because uh, I was doing well to hobble around work at that point. Um, but then there were there was not only so the audible, but then there were all these other books that started showing up at our house. And Scott's not a reader in 20 years. I've never seen him read a book <laughs> other than a textbook. And all of a sudden there were lots of books on the nightstand there still are. There are pretty. I'm looking at them right now, and I'm yeah. like, and they're not. You know, they're very sexual in nature. Oh, really? Oh, okay. And so they're they're all of a sudden he's reading and he's listening and he's walking and he's he well he talked about before his fast food addiction. Now he's packing his lunch every day. Um, so all of a sudden it was. I was very confused. I was like, what in the world? I knew about the book. He talked about this in his other, in the other episode. I knew about the book because it came across my, as a, um, my Amazon yeah. as a receipt. So I knew about it when I first saw it. I really didn't know what to think. Um, th that's where the anxiety comes in. I really yeah. thought, Oh great. Something else I'm doing wrong. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not doing it right in the bedroom. Now that's one other, let's stack another thing onto I'm not doing right. So, I, I didn't I didn't really the the book part didn't bother me as much. It just kind of added another layer to my anxiety. Yes, so it did bother me. I should say, but it was more just I was confused for yeah. probably the first two weeks, maybe. It was the first week was really rough on her. Um, I mean, she was freaking out about two days after my awakening because I mean I told you in the first interview that I changed a lot i mean i changed practically who i was at that moment so it was very very striking like it wasn't anything she was kind of guessing like what's going on like no there was no gradual no i mean it was i'm drastic. going to the gym for two hours a day i'm eating healthy i'm reading a book i'm walking at lunch very i want to be better yeah and that's that's here we are with the, the ocd stuff again like I didn't do it half-assed. I mean, yeah. I was one hundred thousand percent. I'm going to be better. I want to feel better. I want to yeah. Be better. And I would. I was bouncing off the walls. But it was weird, but yet I couldn't figure out why. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, and it, we 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 look back at it now, and we, we say he was somewhat manic. Manic. I was going to say was, you're describing manic episode. Yeah. He was yeah. so like euphoric about everything, and the, and it and it's it spilled over. All of a sudden, I'm like, "Well, I'm in a pretty good mood because you're in a good mood." <laughs> uh, but I'm like, but at the same time, I'm like, "Okay, I'm in a really good mood." But why are we in a good mood? This is just weird. Like, where did the bolt of lightning come from? <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. Um, and so I would go from being in a good mood to being totally distraught and stressed and crying. What the heck is going on? Yeah. I don't know why we're doing this. Why, why, why is he behaving like this? And then it blew, I guess, about two, two weeks, weeks into it. Was it. two weeks exactly after um, the awakening. It was, a, it was a Friday or Saturday night where, like, she, she totally melted down. Um, it, was, it was a huge talk. I mean, probably the most important talk we ever had in our marriage was that night. It lasted about two hours. Well, what precipitated this big meltdown, Gail? Just the, the culmination of all of these, you don't know what the heck's going on. You don't know why you're concerned. Is this yet another uh, meltdown of his? Oh, is that what you were thinking? And what I was guess your mind? that was the same time that you got rid of the video games. Is that when you oh, moved yeah, I, the, I, I did it all. I, it I, all I, happened. I it was just all this I, big... I'll be honest. I mean, I, I don't want to interrupt, but I mean, I was like in my head when I had that bolt of lightning experience, I was like, okay, what are my vices? What's holding my ass back? Like, yeah. it's all done, gone. I'm, I'm done. I'm done having anything negative in my life or anything negative holding us back as a couple, mm -hmm. negative holding me back as a dad. Everything I could think of, I eliminated literally within 24 hours. But I think it was that, but he wouldn't really 
talk to me about it. I he was just kept say, saying, yeah, how much should he bring gonna you in? Be yeah. better. I'm going to be a better man. I'm going to be a better man. And that's the, and I, I just like, I, I need more. I need, I need more. I need more details. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I need some reason. I'm a very logical person. Well, sort of, not really. You I'm very emotional. <laughs> so Scott, Scott, um, Scott, were you, uh, were you holding back some on purpose or, uh, or was yes. there really not much more than, Hey, I want to be a better man. I, that was it. Uh, but I also, you know, obviously read the book and I was making some of the mistakes. Absolutely. Um, I was, so I didn't want, I absolutely wanted to do it for me. I was like, okay, I'm changing this for me, not her. And, and whatever happens, happens. And I mean, I'm, you know, I say it all the time to the guys in the group. I was like, this is the stuff I preach. And I freaking lived it. I mean, that's, it was for me. And I didn't want to put that on her where she thought mm-hmm. that, like, you know, okay, I'm a shitty wife. You know, I didn't want that for her. I wanted, I wanted to be better for me. And, and I mean, it. that's, that's, that's what it was. So I didn't, I didn't share a whole lot with her on that. So Gail, did, was there a concern of yours that you're watching a man um, going through somewhat of a crisis and subsequently will be leaving you? Did that ever cross your mind? Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to remember really. <sighs> or the more obvious, did you ever worry that there was another woman in the, in the mix? I think at one point I asked him that. Um, it, was, it was during the two hour conversation. Because I was so just, and I keep using the word confused because I don't know what other word to say. I was just, I was, and I was tired. I was stressed. I was mom a hundred percent. Yeah. I was, I knew that things weren't where he wanted them to be in the bedroom, but I didn't think they were bad, but they were. then, <laughs> so then it's okay. Well, what are all these things I'm doing wrong? Why it just, I, I kept putting it, he kept saying, it's me, it's me, it's me. And I kept thinking, bullshit, it's me. And you're yeah. not telling me. And yes, at what point are you going to be so much better that now you're too good for me anymore? Kind of thing. So I, yes. Although I don't know that in reality, I really thought that he would leave, but mm-hmm. Yes, I would say. I mean, it crossed my mind for sure. So was it after that big two hour talk? Did that kind of put you at ease somewhat? Like, okay, now I'm I'm more in his brain. I can see what's going on here. Well, so that two hour talk involved Oof. the like dropping the bomb of the porn stuff. Did, yeah. And and everybody's like, well, not everybody, because not, 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 not that many people know about it. But um, I guess now the world knows about it. But I had no clue that that was going on. Oh, and, really? No, no, no. Yes, right. Stay surprised. Yes. I, no, I had no idea. And I don't know if that's the conservative, naive, mm-hmm. innocent side of me. I mean, not that, not that I'm that naive, but I, I didn't even know. I had no idea. Zero idea. I figured it was zero idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so he drops this on me and then I'm even more confused. And I'm, because I don't really know what that means i don't you know (laughs) like what degree of this and what like he um, he says i got a problem with porn i've been watching it forever you're in your mind you're like exactly what does that mean like are you watching it like (laughs) hours a day are you are you are you starring in porn what is what exactly what's (laughs) (laughs) you got a porn problem What, what are we talking here so, and he tells me he's been doing this since, you know, he's had this problem since he was in his teens. And I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, how the heck did I not know about it? And then the, all the things go through my mind of, does that mean when we're having sex, you're thinking about somebody else when mm-hmm. you're thinking like, I didn't understand if it was, I didn't, I didn't, I, I've never watched porn. I mean, other than like, you know, TV shows that are kind of sort of, porn, mm-hmm. <laughs> but like never like the true to the. The full the definition deal. Yeah, yeah. of porn. And so I didn't really even know, did that mean that, are you watching real people? Are you watching like mm-hmm. robots? Are you watching, um, I mean, I know these people do it for a living, so they're getting paid. Um, so, I, but then, it, but then it put a whole nother like level again of, 
what are you thinking about? And he's like, no, but I'm just stopped. I've just stopped. I've stopped watching all of that. I've stopped. And I'm like, okay, well, how do you do that? How, how do you really stop that? I mean, it's one thing to say I stop, but okay. What does that mean? You throwing your computer out the window? How how does that work? Right. So, I mean, I remember thinking weeks later when he would, you know, be in the bathroom too long. I'm like, Oh, Oh, what are you doing in there? Yeah. 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 (laughs) Um, well, I mean, the, 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 what he's going through with the, dead bedroom fix stuff. Hey, by the way, there was also this thing with porn that all kinds kind of points to a level of secrecy or a world outside of your little bubble of your marriage. And that's got to breed all kinds of uncertainty in you. Like he's been doing what for how long says who it's kind of like if he said I had a gambling problem or something, what gambling since when on what sports? When I did feel a little bit like I didn't know about the I didn't know how bad the suicide part was. I didn't know about the porn. I mean, I knew about the video games because he played them in front of me. But then I'm like, well, what what else am I missing? And how can yeah. I be this blind? And am I that naive? Or am mm-hmm. I just blind? I, yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know at that point. But So at what point? So he's he's really put all his cards out on the table. Here's who I am. Here's what's going on. Um, maybe not a thousand percent in that two hour. I keep coming back to that two hour conversation. Would you say, Scott, you were pretty much you put all your cards on the table at that point, or were you still holding back a bit on the dead bedroom fix stuff? No, I, that was, it was all on at that point. Like, okay. cause I was two weeks into it. I mean, she knew I was different and yeah. like I was, I mean, I'm telling you, man, I was bouncing off the walls. I, I had so much energy, you know, I, I told you before with the porn thing, like I had no idea that it affected me that much physically. Yeah, there is there is something I think you mentioned this too, which is a very real phenomenon that some guys are reporting that for guys that were really heavy into porn usage, as we say, um, mm-hmm. that as soon as they stop, and then a certain amount of time passes, they're like, uh, I kind of feel different, and they oh, do, yeah. and a lot of men do report kind of a manicky kind of phase of rewiring the brain. I don't know exactly what the mechanism is that's going on there, but it's just like the brain's like, well, I guess I got to go back to being normal mm-hmm. non-porn brain again. Yeah, what it was, I, I told you before, it's, it's, you have excess dopamine and it's yeah. natural. So it's like you don't, you, it, there's no triggers, there's, there's no um, stimuli. Mm-hmm. It's just in you. And that's the way I was. And I'm telling you right now that I probably have never felt that good in my life where it was like running through me constantly and it gave me so much energy. And, I, it, it was amazing. It was an amazing feeling that, that it wore, it wore off after about three weeks. I was going to, I was going to ask how long would, you know, did that persist yeah, for quite a while? And, like, and during this, time, she's like, she's like, you're not, there's no way you're going to keep up this thing and <laughs> I kept it up for weeks. And she's like, there's no way you're going to keep this up. And, and I was like, watch me, you know, and, and oh my gosh, you know, but I, it finally wore off after about a month. Um, and so, so I, I yeah. kind of flatlined and it, I never really dipped down. I was expecting it to, I was expecting to crash. Yeah. Yeah. But I, that never happened Well, with manic depressant people or bipolar as they call them. Um, you know, there's the severe ups and downs and the next thing you know, they're in bed for weeks. Mm-hmm. Yep. I can see that can happen for sure. Mm-hmm. And so Gail, was there, was there a part of you, you know, that's kind of just sitting back with your hands on your hips, just saying, yeah, I'm watching you manic boy, but, Mm-hmm. Let's just wait for the other shoe to drop, and uh, here it comes. You're just going to drop all this self improvement thing here. You're going to do whatever, and you're going to go back to old Scott. Was there a part of you that thought that? Oh yes. Oh my goodness. There's uh, there's a funny story with that. Okay, so I didn't really do any supplements with uh, working out until about probably month two, maybe, uh, where I was just, I got pretty serious about like you know actually building muscle and not just dropping fat. So I order up on Amazon, I get this, this big tub of protein and she's like, Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> like, she's like, there's no way you're going to take all of this at all. Like she gave me shit, totally gave me shit. And I was just like, watch me, you know? And I don't know how many I've been oh, through at this gosh, point, but it a is lot. a lot. I mean, probably 20 of those tubs. And, um, <laughs> that was hilarious. I thought that was so funny. It's like, there's no way you're going to take all this. So, that there is a point and anybody that goes through these kind of changes, you have to kind of prove to your little inner, inner, inner circle around you. Like I'm for real because it seems like everybody is just waiting to just sit there and kind of belittle you and like, yeah, uh huh. Sure. Uh, right. Mm-hmm. Whatever it may be. 
Um, so Gail, at what point did he sell you on the fact that, no, this is kind of a permanent thing going on here? I, it took a while, but we, we were, we were also, there was a process for us about learning how to adjust to like a new evening. Oh my goodness. I mean, yeah. we, because for so long, so long because at first it was the race car and he was out in the shop for the evenings. Then it was the video games and he was playing video games for the evening. So all of a sudden when he dropped all of that and then he would, he was reading. And so then I would put the kids to bed and I would, or we would, but normally it takes me longer (laughs) to get out of their rooms. And so I would finally come downstairs and he would be laying in the bed reading, which was, I was like, who is this? It's reading. Mm -hmm. So, but we kind of had to readjust because, and that was, and that's where, I mean, some of my issues came in because when he was doing all of these race car and all of these things, a video game at night, it was, you know, I threw myself into work and I would sit at my laptop for three hours at night. And so then all of a sudden now he's not, He's laying back here in the bedroom. I, I can't exactly pull out my laptop and work. Um, that's that's when I took over uh, DSO. When um, that's when I started doing my lover role and started really turning on the charm because um, at the time, I told you before, you know, before this whole awakening happened. I mean, I, I kind of assumed where marriage was different. You know, I saw my parents how they were, and they weren't really lovey dovey, and and so that's when I started laying on the charm like I was dating my wife again and I would turn on the slow music and we would start dancing slow we did that like every night and that 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 honestly that changed everything in my opinion that's that's when we started like I, that was after you called me a workaholic and an alcoholic <laughs> yeah and she unplugged when I did that yes oh, that was after well, the hell let's go into that you know putting talking about putting Gail <laughs> on the whipping post here so <laughs> Absolutely, let's do so it. you have Gail some um of your own little things going on there. I mean, did he have a point with the work and alcohol thing? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I will freely admit both of them. Yeah. Um, It was, I mean, in part of that, it started out as we, when we bought the practice, he was in patient care more hours a week than I was. And so I took care of more of the business side because I had more hours to devote to the business side, whereas he was it with patients, um, making, <laughs> generating the income. So it started out as me just doing the paperwork, which kind of morphed into, we bought a 40 year old practice that had lots of issues that I wanted to better. And, you know, he would go out to the shop from eight to 11. And I'm like, well, I'll make use of my time. Kids are in bed. Scott's outside. I thought it was perfectly normal to sit down with my computer and churn out, all of my work that I needed to do and all these plans I had of changing our practice. And it became a running joke at the office. The staff would be like, Oh yes, Dr. Gale sent me an email last night at 10 30. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm like, sorry, I don't expect you to get them at 10 30, but I, they'll be in your inbox when you arrive at work. And I thought this was completely normal behavior because, Hey, I've got three hours that I'm in my house by myself. And so, but then, and that, was often accompanied by a glass or two of wine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so but I thought all these things were completely normal because I was by myself. Um, I had a really good friend who uh, was also in practice and she would text me and be like, Hey, what are you working on? And we would chat about work. Well, that kind of turned into, Hey, are you having a glass of wine? Let's <laughs> have a glass of wine together, mm-hmm. even though we're not in the same room, you know, and it, it was okay because then your friends justified it to you. Oh yeah. Um, I know the old mom yeah. juice as they call it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. And Absolutely. you know, and, and I will, and, and I do not. Okay. Scott will tell you that I was an alcoholic. I do not, will not admit that it was taken that far because I wasn't day drinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, the, the barometer for what makes an alcoholic an alcoholic, uh, it depends on who you ask. Yeah, true. true. It, and so, um, and so uh, you know, somebody that has a drink every night, you look at that and you go, that's actually 30 drinks a month. That's uh, some people go, lot. some people yeah. go, holy shit, that's excessive. Other people, it depends on your culture and stuff. My, my family's mm-hmm. from Spain and they just drink wine like it's water. I mean, it's no big deal. Mm-hmm. And I remember going to a, um, a cafe when I was little and when I was over in Spain and watching these workers who had been working outside 
all covered in dirt and grime and they come into this cafe and they order a bottle of wine and just chug it and they would pour it into glasses of like seltzer water and mix it together to make and they would just drank it like it was nothing and go right back to work and my first thought is this little American boy was, they got a problem. <laughs> and my mom's like, no, that's just what they do here. So it eh, depends on your perspective. So the big question, though, is if somebody were to take away the wine in the house and you went for your drink at night while you're sitting there on your laptop, is that a run to the store moment so you can get a replacement? Or is that a eh, no biggie? That would have been a where is the wine that I really don't like, but I keep for emergency purposes. Oh wow! So you had a, yeah, I mean yes, it, it did. It did, and you know, it started, and it started as a glass. I, I mean, I freely admit it started as a glass with my work. I was by myself. I had my glass of wine and did my work, and then went to bed. So it's that's the way it started. Then it kind of morphed into well, you know, when you drink that much, one glass doesn't really take away the anxiety anymore. Mm. You know you. You use you take use one glass to kind of numb the anxiety. Well, all of a sudden it took two to kind of numb the anxiety, uh, and then it turned into well, yeah. maybe I should have three because then I feel really good. As, as go- yeah, as anyone will tell you in the mental health world, alcohol is a potent anti anxiety drug. It mm-hmm. it really genuinely works for a lot of people. Pro- mm-hmm. Problem is, <laughs> it can go too yeah, far but- in a hurry, and next thing you know, you're stumbling around yeah. the room and. It becomes right. it becomes an addiction and et cetera, et cetera. But this is how a, a lot of guys report. My wife doesn't get sexual or any kind of sexy or anything unless she's got a couple of wines in her. Well, she's just feeling anxious and that tears down some of the boundaries. So mm-hmm. you were, I mean, are you telling me now that you feel you were self-medicating in a way? I do. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, and, and then it became, and then it became a tension when a tension reliever too. And Scott's point was when we had our discussion, his point was he felt like I had to drink to have to go to bed with him at night. <laughs> and he didn't like the fact that I would. And, and that wasn't, it didn't start out that way. So Scott, how, why, why was the drinking a problem? It, it felt like she had so much anxiety that uh, that she had to drink to be intimate, and that's mm. it, that really bothered me. And like it wasn't, I wouldn't say it wasn't anything like the talk or anything like that. It was more the fact that it just, you know, it, it was excessive, man. Like like I know she's kind of playing it off a little bit, but it was it was pretty much a bottle a night, and. It was, like three, four. It was, yeah, and that's a lot. <laughs> that's it, a good amount know, of booze. I'd, yeah. I'd hear the sound of the, the cork popping, mm. and, it, and it became like, fuck. I you don't know, know how like, he heard it through the headphones, but <laughs> well, he can't hear me when I called him to dinner. No, this is, this is I, 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 I threw up the boundaries. That was after my awakening, so I was um, not playing video games at that time. So okay. I, I heard it. I heard the cork popping. I heard the gurgle, gurgle, gurgle of of the of the gluck, bottle. Gluck, 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 gluck. Yeah, and that sound became like it wasn't bad at first, but it was like because this was like three or four months into it. I mean, we were we were already like um, in amazing shape. You know, we were. I mean, you know the story. We were we were very very well on our way to a, a very happy life, and and she was still drinking. And that that's what bothered me. Like I was like it almost felt like like she it, it maybe devalued it just a little bit of all the work we were doing. Yeah. And you know, where like, is this really her or is this the alcohol talking? Mm. No, and that's that's where it bothered me. It, you know, it wasn't it you know, I wasn't being a dick about it. I was I was just concerned. Yeah. You know. And it was it was a lot. So and, so and, Gail in, in hindsight? You kind of glad he stepped up and said, "Hey, I don't like this." Oh yes. Yeah, and so it woke me up. To, well, and I will say the, and even from the work part, I mean, the alcohol is one thing, but even from the work part, I was drowning, and I didn't realize that it 
it wasn't helping me. I felt, I kept telling myself, well, if I can get these three things done tonight, I don't have to do those three things at work tomorrow. So I'll feel better. Well, no, you just add three more things the next day. It just, it doesn't ever go away. And I couldn't, I couldn't find a way to step away from it until he had this, we had this very frank conversation and it was, you work too much and you drink too much. Like they were all kind of the same conversation and, yeah. and, and we still drink, don't get me wrong. We're not oh, like, yeah. <laughs> we still have wine and beer and we're, but, mm. but, but there's a significantly less, there's a significant less amount in our house right now than there was. Um, the boundary I put up um, for everybody that's listening to this was um, no alcohol during the week. No, oh, well, good. Well, that's pretty. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's specifically what I said. Like, it's okay to, to drink on the weekends here and there, but during the week, I was like, no, that's no. I wanted to see if she could do it, to be honest with you. And I was so mad oh, at him. Was oh, really? Oh, oh, God. Well, because at the time I was in, I mean, I was in denial that it was a problem. Um, and she did it to her credit. So, so was, and I did it because I was so mad. It was, part, was, part this, it. was part of the scale, like, uh, stupid Scott and this, this manic, you know, episode that he's in of self-improvement. Now he's trying to make me self-improve right along with him. Damn it. Just leave me alone. I was just mad that he called me an alcoholic. <laughs> I was just pissed. Yeah. Had you been, uh, ca- had you been called out before for something like that? Not necessarily no. like that in a relationship. Has he ever put up a boundary like that before? Like, no. I, I don't like this. Cut it out. No. Yeah. Not that I can remember. Not no. as big as this one. That yeah. was a big one. I mean, I really, and I would say that one was easier than the work one. I mean, the work. The oh, I can one. imagine. Yeah. Okay, fine. I won't open the bottle of wine. I mean, I'll leave it in the pantry so it's not cold, and then it doesn't interest me. Mm-hmm. Um, but the work one was harder because it, you know, it's it's mobile as well because all my emails are on my phone. So even when we were trying to you know hang out watch tv i'm like oh well, let me just check this one thing really quick um or it was just the stress of having it hanging over my head i could not i mean it's taken me a year it has taken me the better part of a year to really be able to stop work at whatever time that is and say okay now i am mom and wife and Work will be there tomorrow. Mm-hmm. It's taken a long time the to get summer, to summer, man. Point. Like, like when the kids got out of school for the summer, like that's when this this thing really took hold. Where, you know, where honestly, if I told her you don't have to work tomorrow, I got it. She would probably be open to it. And I'm telling you, six months ago, she would have she would have slapped me in the face if I said that to her. <laughs> where like I want to see patients, and and now, I I I mean, I could see her gears turning right now and be saying that. Um, where if I said, you don't have to work anymore, you can just do the, the paperwork side of it. I got the rest and I, I don't think she would say no to it. So overall, is it, is it safe to say that Scott went through this pretty major self-improvement kick, which involved all facets of his life. And big part of that was ditching some of the vices that were kind of holding him back and you Gail followed, but not necessarily just, you know, you didn't just say, yeehaw, I can see the changes he's going through. This is great. Let's do this. But it's in some ways he kind of had to strong arm you a little bit into, Hey, put down the wine dummy, you know, stop working so much. It's, you know, pay more attention to me and the kids and stop self-medicating. But in a way it was a strong leadery type of thing. Um, is that all sounds great to me. But is there something, Gail, in your mind that, eh, I don't like the way this went or this could have gone a little better or is there somewhere along the way that he can kind of um, adjust his game plan, so to speak? It went pretty well. Well, good. Um, I, at first, I think the the work part was a little bit harder because his answer was his answer was you just need to cut back your hours just cut back your hours because that's what's stressing you out and i interpreted that very poorly um i told him over and over it sounded like he just wanted me to be barefoot and pregnant Mm. (laughs) Um, and, and that's not it at all um but 
he was saying, and it's okay if this is, if work is stressing you out, then we're in the point in our lives where we don't he could, he could take over and he could take over that burden. And so that I d- would, could, I could alleviate that burden. Mm-hmm. And that took a while um, for me to really, because I worked really hard to get to where I was, where I am. Yeah. And I felt like, I felt like through some of our conversations, he was devaluing yeah, yeah. the work that I did. I mean, I'm we, we are in the same career path. I mean, we're in the same career field. And but him to say he's trying to be the leader and the strong one. And I took it as mm-hmm. you want me just to throw all that away. I worked really hard to get here. I'm not throwing it away. Yeah. But he, he, he wasn't saying that. But that's the way I interpreted it. So that was a little bit of a. I feel like was a little bit of a stumbling block for yeah. us. What's funny about that, I'll, I'll interrupt just a little bit. We had that conversation so many times in our marriage. I can't, I can't even tell you how many times we had that particular uh, conversation. And after I really, really embraced my self-improvement and, and, and really, really embraced my role as the leader of our house, that was the first time it actually took hold. And mm-hmm. it's very, very interesting that that happened. Um, and it took, it, t- it took, I mean, we're all, like I said, almost a year into this and it took, it took 10 months probably to, to get me to the point where I could talk to her in a non-derogatory way and make her feel threatened. Mm-hmm. And, and actually finally getting across to her, this is in your best interest. This is, this is a good thing, you know? And but so, then I don't want him to take on all of that burden and re- revert back to, I'm going to go car, drive my, I'm going to yeah, see yeah. three times as many patients, but then I'm going to drive my car into a break. Like, yeah, yeah. I didn't want to revert back but to that me, either. Financially, we are in a, in a totally different place than we were five years ago. So, you know, we are, we've done well in our, in our, in our life. And I grew up with absolutely nothing and, it doesn't take much for me to, to, to keep going in my life. Like I, I like having my wife, you know, she's, she's, she lives in a nice home. My, my kids are well taken care of. They're in private schools. Like, you know, I've accomplished my provider role. I mean, I could retire right now and we would live comfortably the rest of our lives, honestly, but I don't want to do that. And I, I have no problem working hard. Okay. And that's just, that's what I do. Mm-hmm. And, and now, like, she doesn't really have to do that. And that's a good thing. It makes me feel good. It yeah. makes me feel like I'm doing my job. And that also has to change completely the whole, uh, oh, the, the general feel of the relationship. Is, you know, when you have a lot of that stress is gone, you're, kinda, you're more apt to, well, the anxiety gets cranked down somewhat. And um, you're more apt to be uh, open to ideas and changes and everything else versus you don't know if you're going to be able to pay the light bill next month. Boy, that changes everything, especially for the wife. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So to wrap things up, uh, the book is called the dead bedroom fix. So Gail, your, your ears may turn a little red, but we're going to talk about sex now a little bit. <laughs> 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 so I'm going to assume that the intimacy between the two of you, I'm going to keep this as, as, as vanilla as possible. The intimacy between the two of you, I would say has increased, uh, improved. Improved is probably the better word. Both. Very good. <laughs> increased and improved. So, Gail, let's put it this way. What was holding you back before? And number two, why all of a sudden is the knob being cranked up to 11? I think, well, Scott and I's pasts are very different. Um, as, uh, in terms of relationships, Scott, um, if you listen to the other episode, he'll tell you about dating four women at one time and, nice. um, having a lot of experience with women. Um, I had a long-term relationship when I was in college mm-hmm. that, so I was, had a five-year relationship and then dated here and there, but I wouldn't say my experience level was anywhere close to Scott's. And so I think some of it was just pure insecurity. She's a, she's a good girl. 
okay, she is absolutely a good girl. She's conservative and she's naive. And so she felt very threatened by anything that I would with my experience. So, yeah. um, and that's the other thing too. I mentioned this in the, in the other podcast where I thought I had it in my head where marriage was different. It, there's a, there's a huge difference between a one night stand and a marriage. Mm. That's just the way it is. Okay. Mm. There, that, that will never change. Okay. When you, when you have a one night stand, you can do anything and a woman would be completely open to it because she has zero to risk. And it's totally different when you've known somebody for 20 years and you have all of this invested, you have this empire that you've built together and Mm -hmm. there's a lot, there's a lot riding on it. And not to mention the resentments between the two of you, which just naturally build over time. Absolutely. And I, I take full responsibility for that because I let that happen. That was my fault. And it's weird because I wouldn't say I shamed my wife, but it was more, where I didn't, I didn't cook the souffle. That's, that's what, that's, I expected, like I was comfortable and almost expected sex because she's my wife. Okay. Mm -hmm. I totally forgot about, you know, the little touches here and there and the little flirty texts and, and, you know, kissing the ear here and there and not being creepy. And that is what I've changed. And so. And Gail, you would I, agree that he, you noticed that he was setting those stages that he was being, did. being more intimate. You know, yeah. It was, and I've always been the type of person who I appreciate the hold my hand when we walk down the sidewalk and I appreciate the, when you come in from work, say hello, we work together, but we don't always work the same hours. So the coming in in the afternoons and saying, hello, how was your afternoon? The strolling around the neighborhood together. I appreciate to me, there's a whole lot more about being intimate than just sex. And I feel like we lost all of that. So then it was hard because, I mean, because of life, we lost all of that, all of that spark and all the stuff that makes a girl have butterflies in her stomach. And, and not all women are like this, but that was me. I was totally in like that little, I need to be, I need to be wooed. (laughs) Um, And we lost all of that with just the the mundane life. And so then come 10 o'clock at night when I'm exhausted and tired and I haven't been, I've been, I've been momming all day or working all day. And then all of a sudden let's jump in bed and let's have sex. Well, so then there were times that it just, (laughs) just wasn't all that good. So then it's okay. Well, if that's not good, well, let's Mm. not do it again tomorrow because it's not good. It's not. And I, and I, I, and I didn't understand really at that point, it became okay for me to, it was okay with me because it was, if it wasn't good, why do it? So then I was okay with just not doing it. Mm-hmm. And I was somewhat relieved when I was like, okay, we don't have to have sex tonight. We had sex last night. I mean, I, I yeah. and I didn't understand like this need, this primal need of a man that have to, that they need to have sex, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll help her out here real quick. Um, I'll sum it up. Uh, kind of from my perspective, because a conversation we had not long ago, it was, it was a good while ago now, actually, uh, I think about it, but she, um, we went on a trip. Uh, we went home um, to Iowa to see my parents. And before we left, it was going to be, we were going to be there for six days, I believe it was. And she tells me, she goes, she takes me off to the side. She's like, okay, a year ago, I would be excited about this trip because I, I wouldn't have to think about sex at all. Oh, wow. And because we would be in separate bedrooms, the kids would be, you know, like they, they, all the pressure would be off of her at, completely. So the difference between a year ago and when we went, you know, three, four months ago, she literally said, I don't know how I'm going to get through five days without having sex. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's, that's, that's the difference. Gail, you rascal. I know, so, right? Yeah. So, I, yeah mean, that's, I think that's that's awesome. I think it's I think it's just the it was this 
dress level and the, I was embarrassed. I was, I I mean, she was shamed and she she was honestly grossed out too. Like there's a lot of, you know, sex is guttural and there's, there's, there's lots of fluids and there's Mm. noises. (laughs) And, and so she, she felt where she was embarrassed by that. That's that side of it. Mm-hmm. And, well, and our, our children have never been good sleepers, so <laughs> no, I was always kids, worried. Yeah. I was always worried about one of them coming in, and God yeah. forbid they see us. You know, I mean, they would, but it, I mean, I didn't realize that. You know, our door locks. That's all. Oh, that that's such a good story. <laughs> that's such a good story. She's like, it was so funny. Like, uh, you know, because we got really hot and heavy at the beginning, and I mean, we still definitely are still hot and heavy. But she said to me, like two or three months into it she's like if you want to have sex just lock the damn door <laughs> you know like she was just lock the fucking door you know <laughs> and uh that i was just like when she said that to me i was just like i could have done handsprings man i'm like i'm like yeah why didn't i freaking do that like that was it's such a simple thing <laughs> well yeah. the, the tone wasn't set before and it wasn't. Uh, before with old scott correct me if i'm wrong gail him after a long tired day and you're just not feeling like it, him going in and giving you that look and all women know that look and looking over at you as he goes click and locks the door you'd be like oh shit yeah. <laughs> true, uh, true. Oh, yeah. as 100%. opposed to he he coming to mama you know kind of giggly <laughs> so it's totally different not only that but it was audible to me where yeah. she would be like oh, the groan like, oh, the, oh god, god you know yeah. well and it wasn't that i didn't Y'all are making it sound like I didn't want to have sex with my husband. It wasn't that I didn't. It or it's not like I wanted to have sex with anybody else. It's just it's oh, not I like understand. he repulsed yeah. me. It was just I was just we laugh when we say it's, I was dormant. Totally I just, dormant. That's a, I just, that's a term that we often use in the group is that women often very often they self report. I just kind of went into a sexually dormant phase of my life after kid yep. number uh-huh. one, two, blah blah blah. It's yeah, it just wasn't on my mind all that much now. The negative of that is until something or someone comes along that makes them say, oh, there's those feelings back again. Hallelujah. Thankfully, it was with your husband. Right. Because, Gail, I can't tell you how many women discover that with the pool boy or the boss at work or whatever it may be. So that's that's a testament to your relationship and to your marriage. The whole theme of this entire talk is one of I noticed my partner was deficient somewhat or doing something not so good. We talk it over. Corrections were made. I noticed this. Corrections made. We work on it together. I recognize I need to be more of a leader. So it's a lot of um, tit for tat, back and forth, but in a good way, isn't it? Yeah, mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that's what it's supposed to be all about. And that's the awesome. Funny thing is, the funny thing is, is that I had that ability to do it the whole time, you know, and I just didn't realize that a lot of that stuff that I was doing was was hurting us and all the stuff I wanted, you know, so bad about our marriage, like, I just had to step up. And, you know, I've always been a good leader, but it's it's the the jack, the, the, the what was it, the, the, um, the, the boss at, at, at work and the, yeah. the, boy, at the boy at home. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened. Like, I mean, I was so driven at work and I just totally let the house go. And I, I put everything on her. She would make all the plans. I mean, y- you obviously have talked to her for over an hour now, and she's very organized. She has lists, you know, I mean, everywhere, all color coded. I mean, she's a very type A woman, and she's very good at logistics. So it was easy for me to just say, okay, you do it, you know. And that wow. is not that is not a good thing um, if you really want your woman to listen to you. And uh, Gail, any final words? I right, put you on the spot, it. aren't I? <laughs> Go for it. Come on. Um, Do you want to plug your business or? <laughs> no, no, no. no. Okay. I don't know. All right. <laughs> okay. No. Um, no, I, I mean, if anything, I think that Scott and I have learned, <clears throat> excuse me, that Scott and I have learned or figured out over the last year is that it's really important to put your marriage first. There you uh, go. That was really hard for me because to me, my kids are first, Mm -hmm. but I think that if Scott and I are working and we're clicking, then our whole family is clicking and we're working because if Scott and I are not working, then 
everything else. It's a whole different dynamic. Yeah. Um, but I'll, but I'll also say, and we didn't we didn't talk too much about this, but I will say just as a kind of ending note is that from a female's perspective, um, it's okay to be a strong, independent working woman and still allow your husband to lead you at home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I know that's sort of a different, but I mean, I think it falls under the same similar, like I had a hard time because I was go, 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 go at work. And then I came home and I was go, 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 go. And and it's taken me some time to be able to let go. But I think when I, when I was able to let go and I am able to let go and let Scott take over a little bit and turn the music on and dance in the bedroom. It just sets a different tone. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and when you talk about leading at home, a lot of your more feminist types may say, Oh, you know, roll their eyes and go, Oh shit, here we go. You know, the, <laughs> the, the old submissive barefoot pregnant type. No, it's not necessarily, we're not talking about, he just walks in the door, you know, woman do this. No, it's like you're talking about setting the tone of the relationship in terms of, Let's get up and dance, you know, folding your laptop and saying, put that away, sweetheart. Let's go to dinner. You know, th- those are kind right. of loving, leading things. And you're kind of a, um, you're being like a steward of the relationship. You know, one of us has kind of gone off track a little bit. Let me reel you back in. This is what we're doing. And we can call that leading or whatever you want to call that. Um, but that's something that a lot of men drop the ball on. Yep. It's embracing your strengths. So, What's what happened? Um, mainly, what happened with us is that I honestly didn't realize that that, that Gail's brain. Like I've done a lot of reading, and I, I knew I knew a lot about female nature. I knew a lot about the sexual side of women, but I didn't realize that their brains are constantly at work. <laughs> the hamster in the work. wheel. Yep. And I that's exhausting. Like to me, mm-hmm. you know, we like nothing box. You know, we would joke about it that uh, that we that we love visiting our nothing box. The where, zone out. Yeah. Yep, nothing. And so we can concentrate on one thing and really kick the hell out of it. Uh, well, where women women can't do that. You know, they, they're, 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 they're so emotional. Mm-hmm. They're so, I, I mean, especially my wife, she, she could get wrapped up um, in the littlest thing and she will ruminate on it forever until oh, yeah. I yeah. Say, stop it. You know, here we, here's what we're going to do now. And it, I can literally see the hamster stop in her face now. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, so when you embrace that, man, I'm telling you, like, it's just electricity. Yeah. And yep. on both sides where I feel accomplished, where I'm leading her and I'm kicking ass. And then, and then she feels like she's not nearly as stressed and she's laid back more where we can actually, I mean, what we do at night now, when the kids go to bed, it is magical. We can either watch a, a racy show on TV. We can have a small talk conversation. We slow dance. We we do all the fun stuff. That the you know intimacy just isn't just sex. It's it's everything else. You, you feel way more connected, so that sex becomes natural. Mm-hmm. It's it's just natural. It's not like hey, do you want to do it now? You know, it's not like that. Like it's like we're having sex now yeah and it's it's unspoken and like you know she'll initiate i'll initiate and and we've changed it up like i mean she honestly in our whole marriage i mean i've i'm pretty experienced and she has definitely benefited from that where i didn't really do a lot i mean we did a lot of stuff before in our marriage but not like it is now where it's it is on she is she has been awakened to <laughs> plenty of activity in the bedroom that she has never even come close to experiencing and seeing her react to that. Oh my goodness. It is so satisfying to me and it's just awesome. So awesome. Perfect. Love it. Well, thank you again, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, look forward to hearing the, you know what happens in the coming years and the adventures of uh, Scott and Gail. So, thank you. Man. Thank you. All right, thank you guys, and uh, we'll see you around. Have a good one. Bye. Right, bye. Bye. Right, see you.